don't want to be that person that everybody looks at instead of Elizabeth uh, in the middle of the program. Um, we've just started our summer season. We've got a great lineup of uh, programs. If you haven't received a brochure in the mail, we have some out at the registration table. And if you didn't receive one, we'd love to get your information so we can sign you up so you get them, uh, get them in the future. But I hope you'll take a look at that and look at a lot of the great uh, programs that we have coming up. And there's just one program that uh, we've added so far that didn't make it uh, into the brochure. It's on a July 11th, and it's called um, Beyond the Bottle. It's with an incredible uh, winemaker from Piedmont, Italy. Uh, her name is Chiara Boskis, and she's one of the first female vintners from that area. And she just happens to be in the States. And we've <laughs> Elizabeth Garner from the State Demography Office, Demographer's Office here today to share some information with us. And I, I prevented you from having to follow the information about the woman, the first uh, female vintner in, in Italy. So um, I'm sure that she will be compelling, but Elizabeth is also quite a compelling speaker. She is the state demographer with the Colorado Department of Local Affairs, an agency that's focused on strengthening the capacity of Colorado communities and local governments. She leads the State Demography Office, which produces population and economic estimates and forecasts for use by state agencies and local governments. She has over 25 years of experience analyzing population and economic trends in the state. Did you start when you were 12? <laughs> she might have started when she was 12, uh, in sixth grade. Um, and her current areas of research include aging in Colorado, characteristics of migration and poverty. She is an economist, and received her BA in business at the University of San Diego, her master's in agricultural and economic economics, and resource economics, rather, at Colorado State University. She's a Colorado native, something that only 43% of the state's population can claim, and I would bet a quick show of hands, it's probably less than four in 10 in this room. A quick show of hands of Colorado natives. Okay, a handful, maybe eight of us. So not, not so bad, not, not 40%. But congratulations to the eight. The rest of us got here as fast as we could. <laughs> With that, I'll hand it over to Elizabeth Garner. Super, thank you. And I think I'm Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming out. I know I, I would definitely show up for the female vintner compared to the female demographer. <laughs> But we'll see, we'll watch you guys, your guys' faces and see how you go with data and information that I've got. I think the big picture to take away from this is that, you know, as you're going forward and as you're either in business or if you're in policy or politics or whatever it might be, that there's a whole bunch of great data and information out there to help with that decision making. And it's really important to understand what kind of big trends are coming forward and might impact Eagle County and the Vail Valley. So that's what I am going to be focusing on. Um, and then there's going to be a long time like to do Q&A. So I'm going to probably get through most of the material first, and then we'll go to the Q&A after that. That way we keep moving, if that's all right with everyone. Um, I always like to talk about what are some of the biggest transitions or pieces in case you only make it to the first slide, what's the takeaway? That's basically it. Um, and that's okay. I mean, on, it's funny. When he said 25 years, I mean, God, that's a long time. Um, and I've got young children, well, children that are just entering, like, college and they're leaving high school. And they're, you know, their questions are like, so, Mom, did you always know what you wanted to do? And I'm like, no. I'm not exactly sure what I don't want to do. Um, but I do love data and information. I do love economics, and so um, I, and I love Colorado. Colorado's like the best place to be doing this, this work. But the things to watch, really migration, and I know that might be a love-hate relationship with this concept, even 
In Eagle, I know down in the Denver metro area, there's a love-hate going on with migration. But there's a reason behind it, and it can't, you know, there's always benefits and drawbacks from most things, right? So can we continue to attract and retain the best and the brightest, though? Can we find the right workforce, labor force, um, is a big question to be thinking about. Industrial transitions. Now, definitely, it's something that the state as a whole is looking at, but understanding what's happening to retail trade. I mean, if you're watching the news, if you're listening to what's going on, I mean, they're talking about the crumbling of retail trade. Well, where does that fit into Eagle County and what's going on in the different communities? Certainly something to keep an eye on. And then other transitions, whether it's in manufacturing, transportation, construction, so many different industries are going to more automation because they can't find the labor force. And what does that mean? So you've got this whole one side, they're maybe becoming more capital intensive. They're looking at automation to increase the bottom line of the firms. But on the other end, that might decrease the demand for employment. Benefits, drawbacks, right? I mean, you might be trying to get more people employed where that might be negative, but you might be looking at the bottom line, saying, oh, that's positive. So there's some things to watch there. Um, looking at aging. I know, aging. We do it every day, though. And it's really good that we do. Um, it's definitely better than the alternative. And what will that mean to Eagle? And, now, and I will be honest with you, Eagle County has been at the forefront. This whole resort region, I think, actually kind of built almost the template for aging policies and aging systems for their communities. At least 10 years ago, the Area Agency on Aging was doing work on how do we retain that 65 plus in these counties. So understanding what, that's, what that might do to, the, to Eagle. Uh, looking at the d change in race and ethnicity in the county, as well as slowing of the labor force. And then this concept of growing and slowing. Um, yes, Colorado's still growing, but we're starting to do it at a slower rate. Will that make you feel any better <laughs> about what's going on in the state? So we'll see. Um, Big picture, it's always important to know that although Eagle is a wonderful place, um, that it's also part of the state. And the state is very diverse. And the state is part of the US, which is really diverse. And so where is the US as a whole? Because we are part of that big picture. The US as a whole is at about 323 million, increasing by about 2.2 million a year. Annual average increase of 0.7%. That's a lot, right? slowest growth rate since 1930. Weird, huh? Yes, yes. Slowest growth rate since the Great Depression. So things are slowing down a little bit. Colorado is at about 5.5 million, probably now closer to 5.6. Ranked seventh fastest at 1.7%, so quick math, even on a Wednesday afternoon, twice as fast as the U.S. as a whole. But the year before, we were second fastest. So seeing that slowing, so 1.7 versus 1.9. Eighth in total change at 91,000. Last year, it was about 99,000. About the same rank. We were about seventh last year behind some pretty big states. But the range in Colorado is huge. Even though we're seeing all of this growth, there's some counties increasing, some counties declining. And that's important for us to be thinking about, and I think especially in Eagle County, where you're, you're at a little bit of a moderate growth right now. And if we look over time, I know you're probably saying to yourself, doesn't she know we're not supposed to put tables? But I really wanted to see all of the pieces of Eagle on here. So we've got Eagle County total at the very bottom. And that's each year, the total population. This column right over here looks at the total population change since 2010, and then the annual average growth rate. All right, so 0.59. And what did I say the state is? 1.7. So much slower than the state growth rate. We look at all of the pieces, and nobody's going gangbusters. We, well, gypsum, gypsum. 1.2%, fastest growing part of the county, at increasing by over 500. So you can kind of see that really this 
time period between 2010 and current has been pretty slow, pretty slow for the county as a whole. And a lot of it really is still recovering from the recession that really hit the mountain communities more than other places. If we look at total population change since 2010, this looks at the change from 2010 to 2016, red, orange, yellow are counties that are increasing in population, all the shades of blue are counties that are declining in population. So again, one of the fastest growing states in the US was one of the best economies. And we still had this last year, just between 15 and 16, had 13 counties declining in population. If we look at aggregate, there was the worst point of time, or the worst, slowest point of time was in 2012, where we had over 30 counties decline in population, even though we're one of the fastest growing states. So what's happening? Well, I can tell you, I tried to do it today. <laughs> Everybody's located right here, and they were in my way <laughs> on the way up here. I swear it took me almost longer to get to I-70, C-470 crossing than it did from there, almost basically to the exit for Silverthorne. Ridiculous. But that's where everybody's located, and that's a problem. And that's one of the first pieces to think about if we've got this concentrated growth. I mean, you're probably psyched that it's all right here and not in Eagle. <laughs> but there's parts of the state that are definitely not being utilized as well as they could be. We've got resources that are being underutilized, like in Pueblo, like in Grand Junction, areas of the state that could and should be doing better. Is there a way, if the state comes together as a whole, that we can think about making sure that these areas that are being underutilized are better utilized? and not everybody along the I-25 corridor. If we look at total population change, there's two pieces. Natural increase is the blue components, that's births minus deaths. We probably reached our peak right he about here for, um, in about 2008 for births minus deaths into the future because we've got shrinking birth rates and increasing deaths. So you put those two things together, we're not going to get that much of a population change from that natural increase. The big piece that transitions a lot is net migration. And we can see that it kind of looks like a business cycle. We know when we saw the booms, I don't know if anybody remembers the booms in the 70s. I do, I do believe I remember those. All right, some, there's one other person that admits to it, uh, maybe two. So we, had, we actually built more housing units in Colorado in the 70s than we did in the 90s. Can you believe that? A lot of that was up here because we had finished the tunnels and that brought all of this growth and that's when we were building a lot of housing units. Then we had that great recession in the 80s, the oil and gas bust, and you can see when we lost population, we had out-migration. We didn't actually lose population for the state as a whole, but we had out-migration. Then we had the 90s. Then we've had that first decline in the first uh, tech bust in the early 2000s. Then we hit the second recession, which you really don't even notice on the net migration, do you? That's because why? Colorado was actually doing better than other places. Even though we lost 140,000 jobs, we were doing better than other places. And Colorado is a pretty cool place to be. And if you're going to be unemployed or underemployed, you might as well be in a sweet place. And that's what we ended up seeing. But you can kind of see where that trend went. We, we hit then our peak probably at that in-migration here, about 70,000 folks. And then we're starting to see that slow down. Here's Eagle. And a lot of you probably remember pieces of this over time. Again, starting in about 1980, the red right here is the natural increase, kind of vice versa, and the blue is net migration. And we can see really much of Eagle County had its growth in the 1990s. Um, lots of growth in the 1990s. If we had the 70s, there would be some in there too. I just didn't have a nice data set for it. But then really since the 2000s, things have really slowed down. The first tech bust was brutal. It was very locally oriented, hit high income people the worst. 
And that's what drives a lot of the economy in Eagle, are those high income second homeowners or you know, I call them just trustafarians. Basically, they've, they've got a lot of money and they live up here and they generate a lot of jobs just by being here. We've seen some out-migration definitely related to the um, recession that we were in. We saw that going on. And so really the only thing that's giving you some population increase right now is your births minus deaths. It's your natural increase. So I thought that this was interesting to see where you guys fit into the picture. And it's really this lack of migration. It could be lack of affordable housing. It could be lack of people that have the money to buy second homes. You know, you've got, you're stuck now with Gen X is in that prime age for buying second homes and it's a smaller generation than other generations we've ever had. They also didn't get the benefit necessarily of the 90s and having a lot of income growth in the 90s. So they're a little worse off than the boomers were. So that might be an impact. Um, I don't know, maybe they're allergic to the outdoors. I don't know. Um, but that is definitely put a little bit of a damper on the growth up here since then. And it could be policy as well. If we look at net migration, think the story's even a little bit more stark in terms of if we look at red, orange, yellow, or places that had um, positive net migration, all the shades of blue or counties that have had net out migration, we start to see, and it doesn't look as pretty on this one as it did on my computer, but there's definitely a lot more counties with a lot of net out migration, um, both on the Western Slope, Eastern Plains, San Luis Valley, that, again, it's unusual to see that when you've got such a fast-growing state and with the economy going on fairly well. When we migrate people to Colorado, what kind of folks do we get? We get youngins. This looks at our age distribution of our migrants, and this shows the age along the horizontal axis. This is age. This is, I mean, the total numbers. The red line is at 65. So you can see kind of our bread and butter um, migrant is kind of between that 20, 22 and 37. We don't get a ton necessarily after that, but it's slightly positive and slightly positive over the age of 65. We don't get a lot of folks. Um, we're not like in Arizona or Florida, so we're not a net attractor of folks uh, over the age of 60. Right now, now could that change? Yes, absolutely, because if you go back a decade or two, we used to have net out migration of the 65 plus. Now at least it's close to zero, so we're convincing some people to stay. Um, this is Eagle really concentrated at that young adult, very much so at that kind of 20 to 30 year old, then a lot of out migration and pretty flat, which is again, I think really interesting because, you know, people come with different packages in terms of skill sets and dollar values. And so if we look at this, knowing that really your bread and butter in migrant is this 20 year old, 20 to 30 year old, and then you wonder yourself, huh, how come we haven't been able to get any 20 year olds recently? Huh, well that would be the millennials, and they've been un and underemployed, they're racked with debt, student loan debt, and what are the dry jobs that primarily drive population growth here to the 20 year old? Accommodations, food service, arts and recreation, they end up being a little bit lower wage jobs. Might make sense why you're not seeing a lot of in-migration right now. Just it's not a good fit currently for the typical types of people that you've attracted in the past. So if we look at where we get people from, I always think it's nice to know where is, where is everybody. We'll see if any of you guys are on this list. Um, and this is for the state as a whole, our net donor, our big donor states, are California, Texas, Florida, Illinois, and Arizona. Anybody from those places? One? Wow, okay. We lose folks to Texas, California, Arizona, Florida, and Wyoming. So basically all we're doing is swapping people back and forth, right? In terms of net numbers, really our net group here is California, Illinois, Wisconsin, Virginia, and Florida. 
Anybody here? Is it again the man in the back? Yes. All right. So we just have one person in that group. You're not a very good representative sample here. <laughs> However, let's look, at, let's look at Eagle County. Same group, but I put 10 places instead of five. These are the net donors. These are the ones where we get the biggest donors in terms of that send people here. Starts with Pitkin and Denver. Maybe not that unusual. You know, play people that know the county, people that understand the county. Then Europe. Europe as a whole is the next place. Custer County, which I found a little unusual. But anybody a Custerite? No? No one here? Uh, Massachusetts, Jefferson County, Delta County, Alaska? Alaska, anyone? No? Florida, Florida? Come on, no Floridas either? Where are you guys from? <laughs> In terms of net numbers, you can see who, where we lose people to, where uh, Eagle loses folks to a lot of other Colorado counties, and then we get Arizona, South Carolina, and Kansas. In net terms, really a fairly diverse mix in terms of getting from, you know, we get from both Florida and California, Alaska, Massachusetts, as well as Colorado County. So kind of an interesting idea of where people come from to fill, you know, whether they come here as residents or they come here for jobs, either way. And why primarily do people migrate, at least to the state, for jobs? Now, it's a little bit different in Eagle because Eagle's just a pretty place to be, right? So a lot of people just move here to be here, not necessarily move here to work here. They often bring their jobs with them. They can telecommute. They can do all sorts of things, or they can start their own company here. But most of the time, we attract people for jobs, and this is a really important one, especially the front range to understand, because a lot of front range places are talking about, you know what, we should maybe limit population growth. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Have you thought about limiting job growth? And they're like, blasphemy. And I'm like, but now, go with me on this. Is a job a person? Well, yeah. Does that person need to live in a housing unit? Well, yeah. And so you're going to limit one, but not the other. They're like, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, OK. How does that work? And we've got some places in Colorado where that's happened, right? Boulder. And we know what kind of problems that can create in terms of transportation. If you come up with a transportation plan that mixes well with that, great. But always understanding that the blue bars here are net job growth, the red line is net migration, and we can see this correlation historically into the future. I know we don't move up and down as much because I'm not really good at forecasting booms and busts, and if I was, I wouldn't be working for the state. <laughs> I would have a better job. Not that this one isn't sweet. It's a sweet job. It's a sweet job. Hear that camera? <laughs> but I'd make more money. How about that? I would make more money elsewhere. What you'll also see is that we're forecasting slowdown. Slowdown in both job growth and in migration into the future. One of the other key things to keep an eye on is Colorado's relative unemployment. How do we do in terms of our relative unemployment compared to other places in the U.S.? Well, right now, Colorado's got the lowest unemployment in the U.S. Eagle County's got even lower than the Colorado average. Colorado's at right at 2. Now, I think Eagle's at 1.7. Okay, unheard of unemployment rates. If we look over time, the green line is net migration. This orange line is relative unemployment. As, we, as our unemployment is improved compared relatively to the U.S., we get more in migration. As we don't do as well compared to the US, we lose migration. So that's a key thing to watch over time. Right now, we've got this low unemployment. So does that mean more people are going to be moving here? It's low around the US, but we've also got some constraints, right, in terms of price. 
that may not make Colorado as competitive. But we know that there's this key relationship with job growth. So how is job growth going in the US or in, the, in Colorado? Well, the dark green or the greener colored counties are those that are back to pre-recession peak. And this is using 2015 data, so it's a little, it's one year old um, in terms of what we have available. All of the shades of red and orange and yellow are counties that are not back to pre-recession peak. So is there any wonder why this looks very similar to our migration map. We haven't had even job growth. So it fits our migration patterns as well is that we're not growing jobs all around the state. And as I'd mentioned, we're underutilizing resources. Certainly big places, big regional centers like Pueblo, El Paso's finally kind of coming back. Mesa County, even over here, Montrose Delta, we can see that there, there are areas that are underperforming. Then we've got Eagle, and it's still back, it's not back to pre-recession peak levels, but that's a little bit of a data issue that I'll talk about in a second. And I wanted just to compare it a little bit more easily to see, looking at employment change from pre-recession peak, which is about 2008, compared to other, other counties. And we can see that Pickin is still way down down 6%, Route is down about 5%, Eagle's down about 1.7%. But that really has a lot to do with Vale & Associates moving its headquarters from Vale to Broomfield. If they hadn't done that, then you'd be back to re pre-recession peak. But it really did happen, so you really are 1.7 below. <laughs> But I'm just saying, you know, it's a little bit of a, it's, it's a little bit of a, you can kind of point it to a, 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 one of the areas. Then we've got Summit is up 8.8. .8. So a neighbor is doing pretty well, as well as then Colorado as a whole is up about 10%. If we look at it and we're making it relative to 2010, so we're not going to take into account pre-recession peak of 2008. We're just going to start at 2010 and we look relatively and using 2010 as like a one. We've got Colorado in the blue. We've got then Eagle in the red. And we can see over time that Colorado's been improving in employment a little bit faster than Eagle County has. You can see Summit definitely took off in 2013. And that was going on. We saw a little bit of a dive in Pitkin. That was some of a data anomaly as well. They had a... Um, a temp agency that was reporting all of the temp in Pitkin, but they served other counties like Eagle and Summit. So that was kind of a fixing a data issue. But you can see that actually, you know, Eagle's not doing poorly relative to other peer counties, but something definitely is going on in Summit um, that's, I would say, even better, that's going to kind of accept. I don't know if it has to do with house price. I don't know if it has to do with proximity to, call it to Denver Metro um, or where it fits into that picture. And that was just job growth. So again, I know you're saying to yourself, really, Elizabeth, a chart like this? And I know the point is, if I had left off utilities, somebody would have said, but what about utilities? <laughs> right? So what I did is I sorted it the highest employment levels, just so you know what is in each one. Highest employment levels as in 2016, and this is the year, over the year change is here, and then over the year percent. Anything in green is good, <laughs> is, po is, is in the positive, and then some of the yellow is in positive, but yellow will go kind of both directions. What we can see, what is definitely keeping you back is that negative 1,158 in the arts, entertainment, recreation, which Vail & Associates is under. And that's about 500 of those jobs-ish. Is that about right? Ish? We can also see that management of companies is down, utilities are down, but you can kind of see where different areas rank. Admin and waste services, which are temp agencies, are also fall under that, are down. But total all industries up 
or down about 1.7% compared to 2008, which was the pre-recession peak. All in all, not horrible though, right? Not bad. If we look year over year, 15 to 16, we can also see where you've had some gains and where you've had some losses. So we've seen some improvement in the construction. We've seen improvement in healthcare and social assistance, admin and waste services, but down in retail trade. And remember one of the first things I said was keep an eye on retail trade. If nationally we're seeing a contraction in, you know, we've seen J.C. Penney's, Radio Shack, Payless Shoes. Now those are a little bit lower end stores that may, might not be here in, in Eagle. But if we're seeing this contraction primarily due to Amazon, what does that mean for Eagle? What does that mean to sales tax? in municipalities that are dependent upon retail sales? Do you have your Amazon agreement where you're getting the dollars back into the municipality? Might be something to keep an eye on just as a, it's better to be planning ahead than caught behind. So keep an eye on that retail trade. We can also see that finance is down, utilities are down, Ag is up. Ag is up. Eight, eight jobs? <laughs> Sorry, just... It's a, it's a low bar, exactly. Manufacturing up 35, about 9%. That's pretty good. So you can kind of see where your strengths and weaknesses are in terms of the different industries in the county. But all in all, year over year, 2.3%. Yay. Right? That's pretty good job growth. Better than, uh, it's about the state average, a little bit better than the state average over that same time period. So not bad. So, any, uh, no, I'm not going to ask you any questions because then you won't let me get on to other stuff. I know you guys, you'll ask questions. So we're going to talk about aging and how that might impact you. So this is Colorado's age distribution. I'd like to lay it out like this. This is a population age pyramid laying flat on its side. And it's broken down by different generations. We've got our greatest generation followed by the silent generation, kind of over the age of 70 right now. We've got our baby boomers, kind of between 52 and 72. We've got our Gen X, which are a smaller generation. We've got our millennials and then our next generation. And it's really important to look. This black line is at the age 65. You can almost imagine those bars mat marching forward a year at a time, knowing what kind of impact that could have to services in a certain area. So this is Eagles. And it's interesting, it's not, it's just, I would say a shrinkage of Colorado with a little bit fewer up here on the silent generation side, but then you've got this a little bit bigger millennial bump right at that 20 year old. And this is what Eagle County looks like. But again, thinking about these bars marching forward. Now, the biggest hit that, they, that Eagle really felt in terms of change was actually even before the baby boomers started hitting the age of 65. Because you did have some of that silent generation that was here, and that jump really started to increase that share of the population over the age of 65. So why do we even care about this? I mean, if you talk to a lot of people, they'll say, well, don't, this is going to sound horrible, don't old people just leave Colorado because it's too cold and too high of an altitude? And I'm like, all right, careful with your words. I'm getting to that old people age. <laughs> Point is, we're a young state. One of the youngest in the U.S., sixth youngest in terms of our share of the population over the age of 65. We've got a slew of boomers, but not a disproportionate share. What we don't have is already a lot of people that are over the age of 65. We just don't have a lot of those silent and greatest. We missed out on the greatest, I guess. I don't know. Um, but we do have a ton of boomers. And they're going to be turning 65 really fast. Between 2015 and 2030, 
an increase of 77 percent, increasing from over 700,000 to 1.2 million, just from celebrating birthdays, because we don't migrate them here, right? Now, neither does Eagle. Eagle doesn't migrate them here either. But they will be aging pretty fast. And it's funny, Eagle is, Eagle is this interesting county. It is one of the youngest counties in the state because you get a lot of 20-year-olds. It's also got the fastest aging population in the state because you've got a lot of boomers. So you are getting it at both ends in a way. You've got this demand at the younger end and this demand at the older end. If we look at the state as a whole, our fastest growing time period in that 65 plus is between 2010 and 2020, which is right now and we're almost to 2020. So increasing at 6% per year. Now, any business people out there? There's only one, three, five, six, okay. Now, imagine your market is growing at 6% per year. How fast is the state growing? 1.7%. And your boomer or your 65 plus is growing at 6%, four times as fast. So if I were a business person, I would be thinking about, hmm, there might be goods and services that this age group would like. And imagine being in a place like Eagle which is really developed by a lot of boomers. There were a lot of outdoor rec. They created the word outdoor rec. And now they're aging into maybe low impact outdoor rec. What are you doing to support that? What are you doing to support retaining that 65 plus here? What services and goods are you producing in that, with that in your mind? that, wow, this is a market growing at 6% per year. And certainly the 65 plus are not allergic to the great outdoors. This is a place where even folks from the Denver metro area could look at products and services and activities that would be interesting for them up here. If we look at an age distribution, sometimes it's nice to look at a picture. This is, again, our age distribution. This is 1990 in the red, the green is 2010, the blue is 2030. So when you can see the blob behind it, and this is the age right here, that means that age group grew. So for example, between um, 1990 and 2010, we saw growth in these youngins, these kind of 12 to 24 year olds. Okay, so you can see that you really saw a lot of growth in the 45 to 64-year-olds. And that was when the baby boomers were aging into that age group. We didn't see much growth in the 65 plus. Now, between 2010 and 2030, where do we see growth? Well, we see growth here in the youngins. And a lot of this, really, these guys, this is if we can attract them to Colorado. And some of you might be saying is like, no, we don't want to attract them to Colorado. <laughs> but just go with me on this. It really is, there's a job population mix that has to go together. What we don't see is a lot of growth in the 45 to 64 year olds. Now, when I first was talking to you about the slow growth in Eagle, what did we just say is the slowest growing age group? 45 to 64 year olds. Who tends to buy second home? 45 to 64 year olds. So we've seen the slowest growth in that age group right now, which I think is putting some of this downward pressure on demand up here in, in all of the resort counties. But there's also something else that's really important about the 45 to 64 year olds not growing very fast. They're your highest spending highest property tax paying, highest income age group. Do we know why the state of Colorado as a whole is in a financial crunch, even though it's one of the best economies in the US? Because our highest earning age group is not growing very fast. 
our older end, which tends to be non-income earners because they're retiring, this makes sense, it's normal, and our lowest age group, which are just entering the labor force. And this is putting downward pressure on income growth in the state, as well as income growth in counties and municipalities. If we look at the population 65 plus in its forecasted growth, we can look at the different time periods. 2015 is in the blue, and then we've got 2020, 2025, and 2030. So what we're forecasting basically from Eagle is a little over 4,000 to over 12,000. A tripling of the population over the age of 65. Now I know these numbers seem little, Right? 4,000. Tripling of the population over the age of 65. Now this is our forecast. This is if you can retain. This is no attracting. This is just retaining your current population that could be sitting here in the audience. Because we again celebrate birthdays every year and everybody's going to turn 65 sometime, right? We can see where Pitkin is, and we can see where Summit is. Pitkin is experiencing very little growth. So you see that that, is, that increase is very, very narrow. And we can see the increase in Summit as well, but not, not as much in terms as the growth that we're projecting for Eagle County. So why do we look at it, and why do we care? Well, there's a lot of things going on, and I'd mentioned first just straight, straight numbers. We can look at the economy. We can look at the labor force. If all of these people are aging out of the labor force and we're having a hard time attracting people, there could be a crunch in terms of people filling jobs. We look at downward pressure on income, housing, health, disabilities, transportation. So does public finance. So does Eagle County have a lot of single-story ranch homes? Why are you guys laughing? <laughs> I know. You're right. You don't have a lot of single-story ranch homes. But if you're on your first or second knee or maybe your first or second hip, are you looking for a single-story ranch home? Maybe. Although you should be doing stairs. That's better for your health. <laughs> but there are these impacts that could push people out. Um, looking at assisted living facilities, looking at in-home care. Are all of these things here? And I know that Eagle has definitely been part of the group looking at aging in the uh, mountain community. But there's a lot of different components to be thinking about, but really looking at this economic driver is really important, and it was one of the key things that the aging group up here was looking at. People over the age of 65 support about a quarter of a job per person. So right now, about a little over a 1,000 of your jobs are supported by the little over 4,000 people that live up here. It's important to retain the 65 plus, right, for job growth. Plus, they're totally cool folks, right? I mean, needless to say, if we look at some trends, though, don't get scared. I'm not going to try and scare you with this, but people always ask, well, what are they doing? What are the 65 doing in term, 65 plus doing in terms of mobility? Well, we can look for a lot of the mountain counties. We're seeing out migration of that 65 plus. And some of you might be thinking, God, how are we going to keep any? Well, each year, for example, in Eagle, 551 people celebrate 65. Turn in 65 every year. You've got about 551 folks. And only 149 leave. So you've got a net increase. Right? That's good. You're retaining at least a good share of those folks. The question I would ask is, did you get invited to all those parties? That's a lot of parties to be going on. I think it's really important to be looking at this in terms of what this it will impact in terms of the labor force. 
Um, the state as a whole is having um, a tightening of its labor force as being at 2%, 1.2% here. A lot of this has to do with aging because we've got a lot of folks aging out of the labor force. About 37% of our labor force is a boomer and they're all, a lot of them are starting to leave. And I know some of you are saying to yourself, no, I know people that are still working, yes. We've seen an increase in the labor force participation rate of the 65 plus from 13% in 1990 to 19% in 2015. That means still four out of five people over the age of 65 are not in the labor force working, even though we've seen this increase. So that puts a tightening. So they're leaving the labor force and they need someone to fill their job, as well as we're creating new jobs. Well. If we're not creating a labor force fast enough and we're creating more exiters from the labor force, it puts a lot of tightening going on and that's what we're seeing. And we're seeing it specifically in education, health, utilities, mining, and government. They're the oldest age industries that we have in the state. And so that's putting additional pressure on those industries. We're also having problems just in terms of job areas. There's currently a low number of long-term care workers and gerontologists really hard to retain your 65 plus population if you don't have the medical community to serve them. We also have parts of the state, can you believe it, that aren't, doctors aren't accepting Medicare. Well, that's a bummer. Really hard to stay there, isn't it? If you don't have, medic if you don't have health insurance. Definitely the metro demands will definitely impact rural areas. Rural areas have always had a harder time attracting and retaining, and this will put even more pressure on it. We're also seeing tightening because we've already peaked. The women's share of the labor force has already peaked, so we're not going to eke any more out of that. Our labor structural labor force participation rate reached its peak. Basically, in 2010, we hit nirvana. Did everybody feel it in 2010? It was, of course, right at the peak of our um, great recession. Um, but it's when we had the largest share of our total population in the highest labor force participation rate age groups. So really, that's when we got the largest share of our population working, and we're starting to see a slowing. We've got this growth in levers. We've got fewer Gen Xers. We've got, we had a high un and underemployment for youngins. Has anybody tried to hire a youngin and they showed no work experience? That's because those were the folks that were un and underemployed during the Great Recession. We need to do all we can to give those folks a chance and get them a job and get them in there because what is a marginally experienced 25-year-old right now? an exceptional 45-year-old in 20 years, right? And that's what we all need. We need exceptional 45-year-olds, nothing against 30-year-olds or 50-year-olds at all. I just picked a nice number in the middle. But we're going to have to grow our exceptional 45-year-olds, and that means taking a chance on the millennials, taking a chance on the youngins that haven't gotten a chance to do the work experience. So get them in there, get them working. This one isn't very much fun because it's showing up as very white because we've got this super, super low unemployment rate in the entire state, but just wanted to focus on unemployment rate for Eagle counties at 1.7, 1.3 in Summit, 1.8 in Route, Garfield 2.3, Pickens 2.3. So really in this area, we understand if your guys are struggling trying to get people in there. And I'm not going to go over that one. We're also becoming more racially and ethnically diverse. Again, how many of you are focusing on trying to create a labor force that's more racially and ethnically diverse? One, two, three, five. Oh, good. There's a handful. Because this is going to be our largest growth in our labor force. So not only have the millennials been underemployed, they're also more diverse. And we can see over time that we're going to become more diverse. Right now, let's just pretend we're at this 2010 level, about 70% white non-Hispanic, about 20% Hispanic, about 10% all other race ethnic groups. By 2040, that Hispanic component especially is going to be about 33%.
And how do we know that? Because if we look at our under 18 right now, they're diverse. We look right now at our under 18 and already we can see about 30% of the population is Hispanic. So what does this mean? We also look at this population 65 plus that is not. Most of these folks are in the labor force, so we've got our white, non-Hispanic leaving, our Hispanic entering, and those two pieces coming together show that our share of the working age population between 2015 and 2020 that's going to be increasing about 70% Hispanic. Now, for some reason, the financial services industry is very interested in this. Maybe there's some mandate going on, but I've had meetings with probably four different financial services institutions within the last year coming to our office and saying, Elizabeth, our population, we can't, we're not diverse and we cannot attract a diverse labor force. Why? Well, I can tell you from my experience as an economist and especially as an ag economist in a primarily dominated male industry, not until I saw other women did I feel comfortable in that institution. And I, I started working for CSU, which was definitely, there was a lot more women there. And that was cool and I felt good. If people don't look like you in an industry, it's really hard to get them excited to work there. So what we're looking at all over the state is where do we create these opportunities for all race ethnic groups to get exposure, to get experience in these different industries so that they feel comfortable. So it's fun to work there so they see people like themselves. So last piece, growing and slowing. As I mentioned, there is this huge connection between the economy and the population. And in order to do our forecast, we end up looking at a job forecast. We take example for all of Eagle's industry, and we look at what they are, how big they are, how they are relative to other industries in the US, how competitive we are, and we grow that over time. A couple of years ago when I was here giving a forecast for Eagle, somebody was saying, oh no, you're kind of growing us too fast in terms of jobs. And I was like, all right, that's cool. We'll slow you down, but that means that you are not meeting expectations. That means that you are not growing as fast as your industry is growing nationally. Is that cool with you? And then they're like, well, maybe we're better than average. <laughs> But it's important to know that, that we, the only reason we grow jobs the way we do is because of who you are right now. We know nothing more special about what you're going to be, only on what you are right now. And we grow that over time, and that becomes our demand for worker. And then we take a current population look. We look at birth rates and death rates based on your age, race, and ethnicity, and that's your supply of workers. We also definitely take a look at uh, labor force participation rate, and as I'll mention, also commuting patterns. And that difference is then resolved by net migration. And that's why we pe bring people in is because we see jobs growing and we need people to fill those jobs. Again, when we put this together, we grow jobs and we need people to fill them and so we migrate people in. And it seems like this is a hard concept, especially on the front range for people to start to understand is that the only reason we're getting people is because we're creating jobs. So if we want the people to slow down, we need to slow down the job growth as well. So what we're forecasting is things to be slowing down, slow down, slowing down nationally, which is creating a slowing in Colorado. Why do we see a slowdown nationally? Because the nation is aging. We're putting some downward pressure on the population in, in the US as a whole. You saw the US is growing slower. Jobs are going to be growing slower because we're just, a, it's finally starting to kind of hit that point where we're not growing as fast. And you can see where our, we are right now. We kind of maybe hit our peak, but it's going to be around that 90,000 for a little bit. And I know all of you are saying, shoot, seriously? And they're all coming up by 70. Um, but these guys aren't drivers yet, so that's the only thing, peace of mind you have. 
These guys are babies because it's natural increase, births minus death, so it's really only about 60,000 a year that are going to be driving up I-70. Um, still a slew of people, huh? And we need to do a lot of work as a state to make sure driving up I-70 is more fun than I even had today on a Wednesday afternoon, which is ridiculous. So with that forecast, we're forecasting the state to increase from about that 5.5 million to 7.8 million by 2040 and about 8.6 million by 2050. And I just said we're slowing. That's 2.8 million between 2010 and 2040. And that's slower. 2.8 million, what does 2.8 million feel like? Anybody know what 2.8 million feels like? Were any of you in the Denver metro area in the year 2010? The Denver metro area was 2.8 million. And that's what it feels like. And that's what we're plopping on the state between 2010 and 2040. Fun times. But that's slowing. Slowing job growth, slowing population growth. But that's what we're forecasting to come into the state. Where are we seeing it? 2.8 million, 2.4 along the front range. Even more fun for me compared to you guys. Even more fun for me. 1.5 in the Denver metro area, 500,000 up north between Larimer and Wells, 400 down south between El Paso and Pueblo with 400,000 around the rest of the state. Fun, yes, fun for me. What is, this is the, I know you're probably looking at this like, oh, that's not a very fun chart. No, it's not a very fun chart. It's three lines, but they're all going up, and that's what our forecast is for Eagle. The kind of yellowish green line is the total population increasing from a little over 50,000 to a little over 80,000 by 2040. What I'm looking at is the total job growth in terms of jobs held. What we're seeing is this increased divergence between the total population and the total jobs. Why? Because you've got people here that are going to be non-workers. You've got people here that moved here in the 70s, 80s, 90s that are going to retire and age in place. You're increasing your 65 plus population of non-workers. And that's why we're starting to see even more divergence between the two. So my question for you is, I'm here, I age in place, I had a job, I stay in my same house. Where does my replacement live? Bummer. I'm staying put, right? So there's some things to be thinking about in terms of the county and where we're moving forward in terms of that change between population and forecast. Where are we seeing the greatest growth in jobs? And I know this is the fourth chart that you're probably saying to yourself, curse you, Elizabeth, for putting that up there. But I want to show you a couple of different things. We're forecasting the total population by different industry groups or industry clusters, or these are great big clusters. What I want you to see is where we're seeing this job growth between 2015 and 2040. These are total numbers right here. We're seeing gr growth in traditional industrial, which is kind of like government, manufacturing, um, agriculture, you don't have a ton of ag, but there's some here. That is under this component here, oil, mining, oil and gas. Then we've got regional and national services, which end up being a lot of the service industries, professional business services, finance, construction, are in that area. Then we've got this thing called tourism. Still forecast to increase. Now, I know this is the maybe point of contention where you'll say, seriously, we can grow even more tourism jobs? We're fine slowing it down. We'll be talking to the county. This is the time of year where we start a forecasting process. But this is if Eagle grows its tourism jobs like it has, like is going on nationally. This includes second homes, not just Vail Resort. This also includes outfitters and everything else that you might be doing up here. So that's a big grower. Almost as big or even larger, retiree-generated jobs. So remember how I said we're going to be increasing the 65-plus from a little over 4,000, a little over 12,000? Those folks are creating those jobs by their spending. But what kind of jobs are those? 
Well, where does a 65-year-old spend their money? Eating out, services, a lot of services that aren't taxed. Are they buying refrigerators? Probably not. Looking at those retail sales will be really interesting to understand how that impacts things, but that's where we see a lot of job growth and they end up being a lot of lower wage jobs. So that's something to be thinking about. Um, but there's a fairly nice balance between total direct basic jobs, so what we're thinking about in terms of job growth that brings in outside dollars, increasing by about 12,000, as well as non-basic resident service jobs increasing by a little under that amount, about uh, by another 12,000. This is 24,000 jobs growing between 2015 and 2040. So it is a pretty significant increase, about an increase in 40,000 people over that time as well. Um, a little bit lower increase in terms of uh, jobs held because you guys have a lot of commuters that fill jobs. And talking about commuters, where did they commute? Oh, along I-70, that's why there were so many people on I-70 today. <laughs> this looks at folks working in Eagle, that actually, um, they work in Eagle County, their home is elsewhere, and where do they commute from? Well, they're commuting all along Eagle, as well as coming in from Summit, and Lake, and Garfield. If I went as far east, we'd see some others coming in from Denver as well. You've got some coming in from Pitkin. So it's interesting, you know, obviously they follow transportation corridors, duh, right? Makes sense. But it's important, I think, to see that. Maybe more interesting is to see how much, again, continued commuting goes on in Eagle County. When we're looking at job growth and we're looking at transportation patterns, we've got about 12,000 people, 12,500, and this is old data, this is 2014. They don't have newer data out there yet. About 12,500 coming in about 12,900 leaving, so that's why I-70 is so busy, and then about 15,000 staying put, living and working in county. There's data that's available knowing where they come from and where they're going to in terms by place. This will also include some weird things that is telecommuting, you know, where you'll see that they're commuting back and forth from Denver. I would not do that every day, but they might do it once a week and telecommute the rest of the time. So. What are some other things that we think, so what, just to kind of tie things up and see if there's any questions. What are some things that we think that you guys should be thinking about? Well, I think migration is still one of the biggest things. We can see that migration has not been on the forefront, it, it hasn't been big. Net migration has not been big over the last decade in Eagle County. A lot of it is because we're seeing some downward pressure on migration due to aging. We see that out migration of about 100, and, was it like 140? per year. That puts, you know, any ins, you know, like let's say you got 300 in, well that takes half of them out in terms of migrating out. So in terms of net numbers, migration, how much, where, what types, and can Eagle continue to attract the best and the brightest? Fortunately, Eagle was always totally a cool place to be, and so it was easy to attract the best and the brightest, but with price points continuing to escalate, can the best and the brightest still live here? Aging, we do it every day, it's a good thing. Eagle's ahead of, the, ahead of the game, I think, in terms of at least it's got some planning in place. It's got an aging strategy. But thinking about how this will affect your labor force, thinking about it as a market, take advantage, no, don't take advantage of the 65 plus, but take advantage of the fact that they're growing at 6% per year. This is a fabulous market to be thinking about. Growth. Can Eagle do something to help promote growth in Grand Junction? If you don't want it here, can we facilitate it somewhere else? It's expensive to do maybe manufacturing here, especially in like the Eagle Valley, Eagle Vale Valley. Are there other places in county that might work for manufacturing? Or does it make sense to help push it to places like Grand Junction? I mean, I was talking to a group yesterday and asked them the same question. If you don't want all these people in Broomfield, what are you doing to help Pueblo? 
When somebody comes in for site selection, do you say, hey, you know, listen, it's a little expensive here. Have you thought about Pueblo? How can we leverage the state better? Looking at that growth, really looking at that disparate growth across the state, how do we do a better job of creating linkages between the different parts of the state? Because we are underutilizing some areas and definitely overutilizing others. And we want to make sure that everybody can still get up and down I-70 to visit Eagle. What are we doing in terms of race and ethnicity? Is everybody leveraging that and looking at that and um, making sure that our workplaces are as diverse as possible? So with that, I will see, do you guys have any questions? And Chris is going to facilitate this. Or he's going to be the mic guy. Yeah, by facilitate, you mean I'm going to run a mic. I'm going to run a mic. So questions for Elizabeth. I have figured that there's a few. What about the... Uh, information on in-migration by income, uh, and I'm sure there's a correlation with the age here to some degree, but it might be a little. So that's a really good question, and it's, you know, it's probably taking me forever to get back to it. I'm getting close, though. So what do you think about the in-migration by age? So first of all, there is data. There is data on in-migration by income. If you are attracting a bunch of 20-year-olds, what do you think their income is? <laughs> so what's very, very interesting with Colorado as a whole, as well as places like the resort region, that in-migrant has a lower than median income coming in. Now, does it mean that they'll stay there forever? No. What's really important to remember is that a 25-year-old becomes a 26-year-old that becomes a 45-year-old eventually. And it's important to grow them and make sure that they've got that, those opportunities to eventually be a higher income 45-year-old. So you alluded to... Um Um, you had alluded to this, um, the risk of people not cycling through housing up here as people age and then not having square footage for the workforce. One of the things I've been trying to wrangle with in my own mind, and I don't have a solution for it, is it would seem to me that if you have somehow subsidized, deed-restricted, or otherwise um, not standard market force housing that you're trying to put online in your community to meet a current need, it would seem to me that that's going to change that cycling. People are going to want to stay in that housing even more so. And do you have any thoughts as an economist how you remedy that? I wish I did, Jeremy. I think that that's the biggest, one of the biggest struggles. And we've seen what Pitkin is going through right now with it. Um, I think it's one of the biggest struggles that we have as a state is what are the best ways to come up with workforce housing? and affordable housing. Um, you know, they forego the opportunity of leveraging that increase in asset valuation or asset value, but they also get to live in Eagle <laughs> at a fairly decent rate or live in Pitkin. Same, absolutely. I think that I think it does force people to anchor. When, when you've got an incentive, a non-market incentive to stay put, what will you do? The, in a bigger picture, we've got the senior homestead exemption, right? What has it done? Right now, the way that it works, it only gives you that benefit if you've been in the same place for 10 years. What are we seeing statewide? Not enough turnover in the housing units for the 65 plus. They're staying in those units, not making them available. I talked to my mom about this, and she uses it as an example. And the exemption she gets is not worth it. I mean, she could sell downsize and do better off, but she feels like she's getting a deal. <laughs> and 
I think there's so many of us that do that, that make choices. I mean, we do it when we're trying to make flight reservations. You know, we look and we bargain and we try and find, and then we, you know, we're afraid to upgrade $50 so we don't have to carry five bags, but we just spent, you know, a thousand bucks on a plane flight. I mean, because we always want to get a deal. And I think that that is a struggle that we've got, a mentality that we've got, and that definitely puts downward pressure on turnover. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, are these uh, websites, uh, is it, are these uh, slides going to be available on your website? That's what first part of my question. So Chris is going to take care of that. <laughs> so it's going to be on... Okay, the next question, um, have you uh, done much determination to understand why some of these trends uh, have resulted, in, namely why has growth dropped? I mean, it's obvious to me, my beliefs, my assumptions, but why has uh, growth uh, deteriorated and, in, and immigration deteriorated also? I mean, I haven't heard much from you about the reasons for that. So why, is, why do we think migration is slowing? Is that, that's basically? Yes. So first of all, comparatively across the United States, our migration rate is still relatively high. Uh, we're on target to gain an eighth seat in Congress. Um, there's lots of states across the United States, especially Midwest, that have out-migration. Now, why do I think it's slowing? I think it's slowing because we're losing our comparative advantage. Right now, the only places that are more expensive are California, kind of New York, Boston, the East Coast. Um, Oregon, eh, we're really kind of on par. Washington, they're a little bit more expensive. Utah, no, much I'm saying better deal. Relative to Eagle, I'm talking only about oh, Eagle. Relative to Eagle. I, I, Eagle, I am going to guess that it has to do with the economy, number one, and price, number two. Uh, may I suggest that uh, both the immigration and the, the limitation of growth is directly a result of the de deterioration of access uh, to Eagle, specifically the I-70 uh, uh, concentration deterioration that we've seen over the last 10 years. So maybe I, I need a little bit more explanation of what that means. You're saying the freeway school. Ac access, access, uh -oh. is, access is the life, access. is the lifeblood of growth, and access has deteriorated substantially over the last ten years, and has to impact growth because very little has been done by, about real. So I mean I, I hear you on that one for sure, but I honestly there's a huge correlation to job growth. Um, and maybe job growth is being constrained because I-70 is constrained. Maybe that's another direction we can look at. But it's interesting. Anybody from California or the East Coast that will admit it? All right. What is our transportation like here compared to where you're from? OK. So, I, so I'm agreeing with you. I think I-70 has some challenges. And yes, it will constrain growth, some growth. But Eagle is still so much cooler than so many other places in the world that I still think you've got the risk of growth. I think the upside risk is larger than the downside risk of migration, even though it sinks along I-70. Okay. I have a more, uh, this is more of a macro question. I think you had showed a slide that was U.S. population 323 million. Yes. And then you have that graph where you showed if you take the greatest, the silent, and the boomer, uh -huh. big group, aging, what does what does the population look like in 2040 with 
birth rate. It's more of a, a large, with birth rate, does it, do we remain somewhat flat at 323? Does it decline substantially with aging, more aging and death? Uh, or does the population grow? So that's a really good question. So big picture, what's happening to both US and Colorado growth, knowing that we're seeing declining birth rates? Right now, the US as a whole is at 0.7. It is actually forecast to decline even slower. So getting down to like the 0.6 and 0.5. Migra immigration policy will be fundamental to knowing what the US does as a whole in the future. Um, I think that's as succinctly as I can say it. Um, if it loosens up, we'll see more job, we'll, we'll see more pop growth. If we see it further constrained, we'll see less pop growth. Um, how does that fit then into the state as a whole? Uh, right now, we are using kind of this flatter pop growth as the US as a whole as a, a bench for Colorado. We're at about 1.7% of the total US population right now, forecast to increase to about 1.9% because we think we're going to do better than other states, like especially the Midwest. Um, but we do not see right now a, let's see, I think I've got this where you can kind of see it. As you can see, we don't really show, this is in 2030, we don't see any declines by any age group. The big question mark for me is always this mid-group of migrants. If the US population is slowing, that means there's fewer to attract, right? So the question is, how good is Colorado at attracting and retaining? If we've got a smaller pot, I think it becomes, um, you know, we, there's more competition. And that's, I think, is a really good question. Um, migration is also driven by incomes. So we've seen historically that even though we attract the youngins, it's the youngins with education that we attract because they know that there's a potential of earnings in the future compared to if you've got a whole bunch of folks that don't, that either don't have a high school or have less than college, are less mobile. So I think that there's, I think Colorado is still on fairly sound feet. We see our pop forecast into the future if you looked, now oh, that's going to be too far to get to, um, slowing down, but we never get below 1%. We stay right about 1% out into the 2040. And that's assuming we can attract migrants. If Colorado screws things up, then I think that there's, you know, we could easily lose it. And I know some of you are thinking to yourself, what do you mean if Colorado screws it up? So migrants are good and bad, right? They're good because we actually need them to fill jobs. And we need them to generate income. They're bad because they also fill space, right? Um, we had this thing called the baby boomers. And we've got to be able to fund them basically through death. They're right now between the ages of, you know, kind of 52 and 72. So if you look at the youngest, I mean, they've got a good 30 years left. So we've got to make our economy continue to churn through these next 30 years and then we can relax a little. I know it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. You know, we need them, but then they take up space. We just don't want a lot. I, you know, I'm just against these booms and busts. If we could figure out how to mellow those out, then it'd be sweet. So my question was about the growth in Summit County, the line at the very beginning. Um, of your program that Summit was yellow. <laughs> um, and 
why Summit County grew so fast versus Eagle? So that is a really good question. I'm wondering if anybody in the audience knows. We have been doing some work in that area to figure out what is extra special. They did end up getting some of those temp workers that were showing up in Pitkin should have been in Summit, so they moved there. But I think we got two hands. To they've added. They've added at least four to five hundred housing units in the past eight years. But this is job growth. Right, but jobs, housing, are connected, right? So what oh, we see, see what through think. our workforce study is that last year, six out of 10 businesses had open positions. I would estimate when we published this year's workforce study, I was talking to Catherine Reggio from Colorado Mountain College earlier, and I think it's going to be closer to 78% of businesses. We're going to see almost eight out of 10 businesses with open jobs. So when you add housing, those jobs get filled. And Summit County has added about 400 plus ho housing units in the past eight years, and and I don't think that we've matched that. So I th I would I would opine that it could be due to an increase in housing inventory to allow their businesses to hire the jobs that already exist that are unfilled. Okay, that's that's good. my guess. If you agree, I feel smart. We're running low on time, and it's a full different discussion topic. We'll catch up afterwards. They have a they have they have different sales taxes to pay for buying land and building housing. Last question, I think. I've been hearing and reading about how robotics in the next 10, 15 years is going to wipe out a half a job in a residence. And now in agriculture, there's you know there's farms with no farms, there's tractors being driven with no farmers, and nobody drives. Them. And it's gonna, you know, it's gonna impact the hospitality industry. We've been at restaurants where there's no waitresses. You know, Dan, was it Denny's? Right. Yeah, you just, you know, there's just like an iPad at the table, and you, you know, you punch in what you want, and then somebody delivers it. You know, you boss your table yourself. And then we've got, the, and then we've got the self-driving stuff. There's a lot of people that, you know, that, that, you know, that drive vehicles up here for, you know, the tourists. I yeah, no, absolutely. That's going to have a really horrible effect on right. not just here, the entire country. It's going to be, it's going to be very interesting. I think it's going to be very interesting. I disagree that it's going to be awful. I think that there's going to be benefits and drawbacks. I think the only reason we're seeing this push towards automation and mechanization is because of these strains in the labor force, and. I mean, how many, I mean, I'm sure you guys, I know I talked to somebody a couple years ago about this. How hard is it to find someone that can pass a driving test for a DOT vehicle up here? I mean, they have to be clean. Nobody's clean in Colorado. <laughs> so if you can't find drivers, then maybe it makes sense to have the self-driver that doesn't have to pass a background test. All right, but I totally agree with you, and that's why I say there's benefits, drawbacks. They're coming in because they're needed. The mechanization, because, all right, so a firm is looking at either investing in capital or investing in labor. That labor's been uncertain. They come in and they invest in capital, they mechanize. Yeah, they're looking at their bottom line, and how many of you here would say, we're not pro-bottom line? I mean, bottom line is, I mean, if a company needs to make it, they need to make it. But yes, that will put downward pressure on labor, but lower service labor. And we've already got this downward pressure on a growing labor force. It's starting to grow at a much slower rate than it ever has historically. So I think the jury's still out on how bad it will be or good it will be. I think the biggest piece is that you've got to be ready. You've got to be thinking about it. Start planning for it. How do we make sure that it works, you know, and that we can accommodate it? So we're running very low on time. I have one, we're past time. I have one last question for you. Um, and if you're willing to stay for a few minutes, we'll take the last two questions from, from these guys. Is, is and, and short answer is okay. You talked about Colorado being one of the highest cost states in the nation. And, and we know in Eagle County, we're a very high cost area as well. We also know Colorado wages 
are lower in many cases, and our wages in, in Eagle County are in many ways lower. So is a low wage, high cost economic model sustainable 30, 40, 50 years into the future? Short answer is okay because we're past time. No. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I think we could all say that pretty fairly. Is no. I mean, that's it. We need to address it. We need to address our workforce, our labor force, our workforce development efforts, our housing, all the other issues that you talked about through your presentation. We, as a community, need to be proactive at addressing those things. Yes. And I think that fits into the technology point that the woman made, um, is that some of these lower lower wage jobs may go away. And people then are able to leverage their skills at a little bit higher level. So that it isn't taking the order at the restaurant, it's actually programming the computer to take the order at the restaurant. How do you say these are low wage jobs? What happens to, I mean, those are, those are like the safety net jobs for you know, many, many, many people. And as many people now have to, you, you go anywhere and you see, well, people falling asleep working in airports because they've got another job. So when you start losing all the safety net, because everybody's been a waiter, we've all had those kind of jobs. Now, those are the jobs that are disappearing. I just kind of wonder what, how this is going to affect. I you know, it's a big, long answer, I know, but yeah. I think people, I, I think this thing is coming, and, and really people are not, uh, yeah, no, I'm I agree. Addressing I, it, you know? I mean, I just think it's... Well, I think we'll look at it. I think it'll happen, and we'll have to work with it. But yeah, I mean, it's hard to do a low wage, high cost. I had a simple uh, data question. Uh, particularly with the 65 uh, plus, did you take into account dying, or are they in uh, out-migration? Ha, huh, that's a good question. No, they die. <laughs> <laughs> they die. Uh, we, call it, we call it the ultimate out-migration, but... Um, no, we have them die. They die in our model, definitely. I know that was probably totally inappropriate. <laughs> I would suggest that the difference between Summit County and Eagle County is access. Uh, Summit County has much better access to the Front Range than Eagle County does, and. Um, also, it's obvious to me for people that drive, I drive the Mountain Corridor regularly, and the section from Denver to uh, Eagle to uh, Vail, uh, the most difficult uh, part of it has the most obstacles is the Vail Pass, which people uh, going to uh, Summer County does, doesn't have to put up with. Yeah. So, you know, access and freedom and less obstacles, all those things are very big contributors to yeah. uh, growth and development. Agreed. Eagle County, they include second homeowners or just permanent full-time residents? Just permanent residents, okay. as best we can. That's our goal is to get those, not the second homeowners. If they live up here majority of the time, then yes. But if they don't, then no. We try not to. It's a hard one. Last question, Mark, and then we're done because we're way past here. Grand Junction? Have I seen <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but the point is, he's, but he's hired. To, he works for you guys. I wouldn't either. If I, you know, it's a hard. It's a. I know. It's a tough point. I work for the state, so I have to care about everybody. <laughs> All right. Thanks, you guys. Thanks everyone for taking the time to attend this evening, and thanks to the Vail Symposium.